Welcome back to Grandpa and the Millennial. I'm Anthony, and I'm here with Natasha. He's the grandpa, and I'm the millennial. <laughs> and today we have a very special guest. For me, it is a very good and longtime friend, uh, one of my boyfriend's best friends, and I've been able to witness and be fortunate enough to be a part of the journey, but I'm excited to dive in a little bit more today. So our guest today is Javier, or Javi Martinez. He is a United States Marine, a general contractor, and owns his own business, and we have lots of questions for you. So welcome to the pod, Javi. Thank you so much for welcome. having me. I feel honored. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. being here. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited. So why don't you give us a little blurb about where you're at in life right now, and then we'll dive into some details. Okay. Um, so 31, uh, happily married, father of two, uh, and I own a construction company. So doing a lot of renovations, a lot of remodels, a lot of rehabs, um, new construction as well. And uh, yeah, I've been a business owner for about seven years now. Wow, it's been uh, it's been a long time. I didn't know it's, it's been so it's long. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, awesome. So let's take it all the way back. We'll start kind of where you grew up and a little bit about your family and that situation. And um, if you will, tell us your story. So uh, I was born in Woodland, California, uh, in 1991. Spent uh, some time in Woodland and then moving to Davis up until about fifth grade, and then that's when we moved to Foothill Farms, California. Uh, that's where. I met Natasha, yeah. I met uh, John and Paul, uh, my two best friends. Um, and then from sixth, day, uh, excuse me, from sixth grade forward, just uh, living in Sacramento, Antelope, North Highlands area until about 18 uh, when I graduated from high school, then uh, joined the Marine Corps. After the Marine Corps, got out, went to go work for my dad, who's been in the construction industry for some time now. And... Um, was his right hand man for a little bit. After about a year or so, I decided that uh, I wanted to be my own boss and took the leap to uh, make that happen. And started started my own business from there. Well, let's take you back. I'm going to take you back <laughs> and ask you some questions. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we're gonna and pull it out of you. Yeah, we're going to have to connect with Amy, my wife. So uh, she was born and raised in Woodland, okay. um, and mm -hmm. parents are still there. So it'll be interesting to see if if anyone knows each other. Um, so when let's go to. How many siblings did you have? Were you an only child? Did you grow up with both parents in the house? So I'm the oldest of four boys. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So just a whole bunch of dudes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then as you went into high school, where were you guys living when you were in high school? So in high school, we lived in North Highlands, um, Antelope area. So right there by Foothill High School over off of uh, Hillsdale and uh, what's the cross? Madison. Yeah. Got Hillsdale, it. Madison. And when you were in high school, sports? Were you a sports guy? Were you a band guy? Were you an academic? Or <laughs> what was your thing? So I played soccer. Played soccer okay. from uh, junior high all the way up into uh, senior year. And as you were going through your high school years, did you, uh, first of all, we're both Marines. So sure. did you have the dream of being a Marine or was there a different dream and that came into play? So I'm, I'm going to be completely honest and I'm, not a lot of people know this, and I'm going to say it publicly now. I actually wanted to join the Army when I was like 16 years old. Um, so a little, little context behind there. Um, being the oldest of four, um, I, I had a lot of responsibilities growing up. So taking care of my brothers was, was, a, huge, was a huge aspect of my life. Um, now, the Army, what intrigued me about it was, you know, traveling, getting out of Sacramento, going around the world and then starting a new adventure, if you will. It wasn't until maybe a year into that decision that I didn't tell anybody about it. So now I'm like 17 ish and my best friend, Paul, one of my best friends, uh, he told me, he's like, if you're not going to join the army, join the Marine Corps. <laughs> like if you're, you're going to do it, like let's do the hardest thing there is. And I was like, you know, I was thinking about it, but ultimately, um, I opted for the army, but then he, he just has a way to, to sway you. And so yeah. I ended up uh, joining the Marine Corps because of uh, my best friend. Super interesting. So what, so aside from traveling the world, what was drawing you to go into the military? So after, after being swayed, <laughs> um, I decided that, you know, the Marine Corps was going to be the best option for me. So, um, Besides the travel part for me was being able to serve and continue to serve um, back. This was also in 2009. So uh, there's a, the huge push in Iraq. And then now they were transitioning over to Afghanistan. 
and uh, everything going on in the world at that time, I was like, okay, well, I want to be able to say that I served and I want to be able to say that I stood between them and us, us being, you know, here at home. Mm -hmm. Um, Very, very naive of me at the time, just in the aspect of being so new and oblivious to like big picture events going around the world going on around the world um that that was my biggest thing was just being motivated to to serve so did you and paul go in together at the same time or were you guys at the same <laughs> san diego right yeah so we went to san diego and yes we did uh join we ended up enlisting together we did uh what's called the depth the delayed entry program uh so we were training you know the last maybe three months of our our senior year and then uh ultimately left that October after we graduated. So that's really cool. It's really cool to be able to go with somebody. So day one, you end up in San Diego, MCRD, you're standing on the yellow footprints. Are you looking over at him? Like, what was I thinking? I, I... Oh, I asked them this question <laughs> around a bonfire once. I was like, come on, you guys, day one, you had to have been like, uh, what did we do? Like, did we regret it? For me, there, there's a huge motivation to do it. So I was all for it. My heart was completely in it. Mm-hmm. I knew that for the next three months, I was going to be beaten, bruised, and battered, if you will, yeah. um, into becoming a United States Marine. So looking over at him, um, we really didn't have that first moment of wow until after the Yellow Footprints when we went inside and they buzzed our heads. <laughs> yeah. So they gave us a buzz cut. Oh and this is the first gosh. time seeing Paul with a buzz cut, like just straight buzzed. And then mine as well. And we we were in this big uh, cafeteria, if you will, that was empty. So we were just all sitting. All the recruits were just sitting. They call it uh, nut to butt, but essentially just back to back. Um, and we look over at each other and he's about four rows over. And <laughs> this, is, this is our first time making eye contact from getting off of the bus. So several hours have passed now. We're in completely li- different uniforms, different clothes different appearance and uh we just both look at each other and like give a give each other a little smirk and say well okay we're, we're doing this so oh very, very definitely cool. a shock factor so what type of kid were you javi i think anybody who who won like travels it's not always for to think like oh i want to get out of sacramento or to join the marines like that's a big thing it's outside of a lot of people's comfort zone so what kind of growing up were you shy were you and i know a little bit but for the listeners I was definitely shy. Um, I was definitely a little bit um, withdrawn, but also I became responsible very early on. So not that my parents needed me to help out around the house or that they were incapable of of being great parents because they're lovely parents, uh, but just out of necessity. So growing up, early 2000s, a lot is going on around the world that, again, I was completely oblivious to. For me, it was just another day, if you will. But Having my parents struggle with, you know, early 2000s, not having enough income and mm-hmm. coming from humble beginnings and stuff like that. There's a there's a, a big responsibility on my end as the oldest to take care of the, the little ones, if you will. And then with the financial crisis of 2008, then we saw like my dad being around a little bit more than he should. And again, me being a young teenager, I was like, OK, well, dad's around, but He's not really working. And that didn't really hit me until later on in life. So early on, just very shy, but still very responsible, taking on a lot of responsibility as a teenager, essentially a second dad. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you're an incredible role model. So did any of your brothers, did any of them join the military or follow you or did they talk to you about it? So yes and no. Um, Real quick on my story. Uh, my grandfather on my mom's side, um, he's no longer with us, but he was in the Navy and he was my initial motivation. Um, he didn't really mention it early on going, growing up with him, but he did have this authoritative figure to him. So after becoming of age, like a teenager and having a conversation with him regarding the Marine Corps, being that it's a department of the Navy yeah. <laughs> and my grandfather is, was a sailor. Uh, so for him to to educate me based off his experience from Vietnam, a little bit different, but nonetheless, that structure and that regimented uh, mentality that he had really resonated with me. So it, w- it was definitely uh, something that I took into account to continue a legacy, if you will. Um, and so when I joined the Marine Corps, I definitely wanted that same regimented lifestyle to push over or at least carry on to my brother's. 
uh, but some of them made some decisions to either immediately go to work or go to college. Um, but it wasn't until now, 10 years after the fact, that some of my brothers are actually interested in joining. So oh, wow. uh, to, to answer your question, yes, definitely a big role model, a big influence on them. Um, and now both of them in their early 20s are, are looking towards another chapter in their life, which is the military. Uh, what branch are they looking at since, since everyone's going to listen to this? <laughs> so uh, one right now, he's looking at the Army um, that for his own you know choices. He made that made that decision. I told him, I was like, OK, well, if you want to be in the Marine Corps, talk to me later um, to kind of kind of give him that little rivalry or at least get him ready for that rivalry. Um, but he's interested in in the army. And then my youngest brother, about four or five years ago, when he was a teenager, he he wanted to join the Navy. And I said, same thing. Hey, you want to talk about the Marine Corps? Hit me up any day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to say, well, you know, you and I, especially when we turn off the mics, we can give the other branches a hard time. Of but course. we're all brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter what branch you go into. Serving is just um, incredibly important to the country. And it's incredibly honorable incredibly honorable thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage if they're looking at that path, whether it's the army or the Navy, I like, go after mm -hmm. it um, do that. I don't know what it is nowadays, but three, four five years, get that under your belt, get that experience or a lifetime. Maybe it ends up being a lifer and they yep. just absolutely love it. Uh, so I think that's, that's really cool. So Javi, as you got into the Marines, so was it what you expected? Did you not know what to expect? What was that like initial span of time as you're going through it was there like oh my god you said your heart was really into it but were there regrets were there you know maybe excitement you're like oh this is exactly what i wanted so regrets no um my expectation was completely blown out of the water um you you can do some research you can go online you can look at youtube videos <laughs> your recruiter will will sugarcoat things um but it's not until you're actually in there where you you see the the night and day difference. So hardest thing I've ever done was United States Marine Corps. Yeah. Boot camp anyway, boot camp, yes. Yeah. And what was your MOS? For those that don't know, military occupational specialty, your job, uh, as I look at Natasha. So. <laughs> for the civilian terms, I get it. I'll take it. I'll take one for the civilians. Uh, I was a 0861. I was a fire control specialist, forward observer. And did you choose that going in or is that assigned to you? How did you end up with, with that one? So for me, initially, I, I knew I wanted to join the infantry or something in combat arms. Paul, going back to him, he wanted something similar as well. So we were actually limited to like a couple slots. And I say limited because of the time frame. So we graduated June 2010 and I wanted to leave Sacramento as soon as possible. Paul wanted to leave Sacramento as soon as possible. So we were both in a similar boat and we also knew we wanted to ship together. It was actually in our contract for the Marine Corps to send us together. The only way we can do that was picking from a pool of limited options. And it came down to generator mechanic and artillery. At that point in my life, I didn't know what artillery was. I was like, okay, I'm going to pull a <laughs> lanyard and, there's, and something's going to go boom. That That's that's because I didn't have enough homework on it because I ultimately wanted to join the infantry as well as Paul. We, we talked about security forces, which is an aspect of the infantry. So our recruiter pulled us into his office and he, and he gave it to us straight and simple. He said, there's two jobs. You guys decide right now who gets what. And it was gener generator mechanic and artillery. Paul said, you take the job. And I was like, no, 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 you take the job. And we went back and forth like this married couple. <laughs> They're the best of friends. And shout out Paul. We'll, yeah, we'll shout, no, shout out to Paul. He's, he's amazing. Um, he's and we were going back and forth, uh, mingling, if you will, in, in front of a gunnery sergeant, this guy who's this big, beefy <laughs> infantryman, and just looking at these two 18-year-olds argue. And he said, better choose right now because I'm not doing this all day. And then I said, fine, I'll take it. And I took the artillery job. And Paul ended up uh, becoming a generator mechanic. Uh, interesting. And so you guys go through boot camp and then do what another month at at, at San MCT. Diego? Yeah. MCT? Well, so it's north now. So we go up to Pendleton after ten days off up here with the family. We go back to Camp Pendleton and do what's called Marine Combat Training uh, for those who are non infantry. So every everyone is a basically trained Marine is a basic rifleman. So every other Marine goes to MCT. 
And then after that, you, you're shipped out to your MOS. You guys together now? Or are you separated? We're, st- we're still together up until this point. I actually denied orders coming home because I asked for a recruiter's assistance to stay for like a month longer. But that meant I wouldn't go through MCT with Paul. So I denied those orders and I go back to Camp Pendleton with Paul to spend another month, um, you know, training, doing all the 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 Marine combat aspect behind yeah. it. Um I ended up going to Oklahoma and I believe he went to, oh gosh, it was Myrtle Beach. I think that's South Carolina. You picked the wrong job. (laughs) There's a, there's a little bit of context behind that, but yes, I did. Um, Not knowing again, going back, I didn't know that I was going to be an artillery observer. Again, I thought I was going to be the guy who's pulling a lanyard and hearing the, the, the cannon go boom, if you will. Um, And it wasn't until I got to Oklahoma, a lot in Oklahoma, which is a terrible, terrible town. (laughs) Um, And it wasn't until I got there that I realized my job was, well, it's a little bit different. I'm actually going to be attached to the infantry guys and I'm going to be calling in artillery and mortar. What the heck? Okay, let's do this. And so that was even more of a motivation for me to to do well. Got it. Interesting. Okay, so at this point, you guys get separated. How how long was um, your MOS, MOS? How long was your job school? My job school was a uh, total of three months. So I spent three months in a uh, lot in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. uh, Fort Sill. <laughs> Travel the world. And then, and then where did you go from there? Where were you stationed? So after that, there's a follow-on school in Coronado, California. Okay. So I went to Coronado for what's called a uh, Naval Surface Warfare School. So essentially it's uh, naval artillery to, to be able to observe naval artillery as well. And yeah, fun MOS. I, I started off as a cook and then I ended up in supply. So nowhere near as fun as you. So from there, where's your duty station? From there. So let me let me backpedal a little bit. Graduated top of my class. I was I don't look at now, but one of the fittest guys there. Um, <laughs> I was the best shot there. So I really excelled in Oklahoma and then as well as uh, Coronado. So Coronado we had quite a bit of NCOs coming around. So at the time, I was a little PFC. And so we have sergeants and corporals who are lateral moving into my MOS mm. after their career in whatever MOS they chose. So I'm outperforming these guys, these guys who have five, six years in the Marine Corps and who are, of course, my senior, who are the leaders in the class and all that good stuff. I, I, I outshot everybody. And so I was given a wish list. So the Marine Corps said, okay, Marty, for, short for Martinez, my last name, like you get to choose, you know, where you want to go. And during my Oklahoma training um, and when I was introduced to the actual MOS that I was going to do, they um, referenced uh, a company called Anglico. It's Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. So their mission in the Marine Corps was to facilitate mortars, artillery, naval gunfire, and close air support to coalition forces that are organic to the United States. Wow. So that for me was like a huge, huge Impressive. green flag. Like that was a yeah. huge motivation. I really wanted to join Ingleco and, and do all these cool things. And so I did it. I gave it everything I had and I ended up getting what I wanted, which was first air naval gunfire liaison company in Camp Pendleton, California. Oh, wow. And so is that where you spent your entire, how long were you in? I was in for four years active duty. Okay. And for those, um, it's somewhere around three years after all of your schooling, give or take a little bit. Yeah. Um, is that where you were at in Pendleton? I was. Okay. Beautiful place for those who haven't been to Camp Pendleton in San Diego. Um, I was stationed in 29 Palms, so I'm oh, a little bit sucks. jealous of you uh, right now. <laughs> 29 Stumps? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I went overseas um, to Okinawa for a year. So that, that, was, that was a lot of fun. So... As we're talking, and Natasha, I know I'm still in a lot of time because we're talking about the Marine Corps. <laughs> geeking out. But definitely geeking out. What rank did you get out at? So I got out as a sergeant. So after three years, I, I picked up the rank of sergeant. So you were excelling. Oh, I was flying. Yeah, you and were you, I was flying. You did a couple, I don't know if you, is, oh gosh, the lingo. Is this? Is it a tour? I you, did. You did a, I couple. Did a couple. Where? Where? So the first one I did was to Afghanistan, spent uh, eight months over there. Conveniently, Paul went out there, too, around the same time. So we got to see each other in Afghanistan yeah. as well. That was a huge plus for me. Um, came back and did a six-month six month turnaround and then redeployed again to the Middle East. Oh, wow. I, I would have totally missed that. I was just thinking about San Diego. So <laughs> let's dive I rem- into it. I remember those tours. Yeah. yeah. This was when they were gone. So that was a... 
So a time. I, I graduated top of my class in Coronado. I checked into my unit a month later. So now we're talking about, oh gosh, it was Jul- no August of 2011. I spent 30 days at my unit and I got orders to Afghanistan, August 2011. So now September 2011. And then I deployed, uh, or excuse me, I did a I did a train up. So I did a workup. Essentially, you do three months of going to 29 Palms, getting everything ready to, to go overseas, getting all your affairs order. And then by February of 2012, I was in Afghanistan. And so you're what, 20, 21 at this point? At that time, I was 20 years old. 20 years old. Um, so those that don't put it into perspective, and it's different. Um, I'm obviously the grandpa here. When, in 20 years from now, when you look back at that and, and you think. I hope I'm not a grandpa. In 20 years. Uh, we, <laughs> no offense. Um, we have a, a 20-year-old that um, graduated high school a couple of years before, just, mm-hmm. um, just starting life. Most kids at that age are sophomore in college, and you're going overseas to Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. You're getting your affairs in order. Oh, yeah. um, it's an immense um, responsibility and honor. So when you go over there, are, what, what's it like? What type of situation are you in? So what I did over there and a part of my job, so I'm an artillery observer, can call in close air support, all that good stuff. But there's also the coordination aspect behind it. So pretty much coordinating with the pilot uh, and then what's called the FDC, the Fire Direction Control Center. And essentially what that was is delivering air to surface munitions and surface to surface munitions. So a lot of behind the scenes, if you will. So that, that was my job when I went over there, coordinating a lot of missions. And we did quite a bit of them um, and, and doing that aspect of it. As far as my expectation, I kind of just relied on my leadership to prep me for that. Because, again, like you mentioned, I'm 20 years old at the time, not knowing exactly what what's going on as far as big picture goes. But I know that at the end of the day, there's a mission that has to be done. So to the best of my ability and perform and do those and execute those missions accordingly. So as far as the leadership there a little bit, so you're young, you're coming from a position where you're responsible, you know, in your home life, and then you're seeing these leaders, these other men and hopefully women leadership in the Marines. But what, what was that like? Do you have any, did you have any mentors early or leaders in the Marines that you looked up to that really helped you through that journey? Absolutely. Uh, Even to this day, some of the guys who were my sergeants in Afghanistan, they're now gunnery sergeants or, you know, master sergeants in their career now. And we still have contact, like daily contact every day. Actually, uh, going back to one of our trips a couple of years ago to mm-hmm. San Diego, uh, one of the guys, I don't know if you remember, this yeah. Asian guy, yeah. he came out. That guy, he was my direct mentor at that time. Wow. So even to this day, 10 years after the fact, I'm yeah. still in very close contact with him. And I and I feel like that's one of the best things about the Marine Corps is the camaraderie that comes with it. The, you, you will build and find relationships for a lifetime. And what made them stand out? So I'm sure you had some that you didn't like. <laughs> so, so what was different? You're going to find a lot of different uh, characteristics. You're going to find a lot of different people who have certain ways of viewing things. You're going to meet people from all around the country who have a whole different perspective on life. And so they bring that leadership over. However, good leaders will never allow themselves, in my opinion and in my experience in the Marine Corps, good leaders will never allow themselves to succumb to like that demographic, if you will. Like, oh, he's a shitty leader because he's from Missouri. No, that's not true. So uh, specifically the guy I'm talking about, he's from Chicago. Um, He was my mentor early on. He showed me the ins and out of the Marine Corps, how to report back, like just basic tasks that ultimately ended up in me being successful in the Marine Corps. So um, that's a very loaded question. I mean, we can talk about mentorship, how they mentored me, basic um, day-to-day skills, being a man, being a Marine, um, how to treat, you know, different subordinates, different ways. I mean, we can talk all night about that, but um, to answer your question, there's some similarity with, you know, the mentorship that I was taught in the Marine Corps and what I experienced kind of correlates to growing up, being the older brother, having to lead by example, uh, being an influence, much like how Anthony said earlier, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of inspiring them to, to do, to do well, same thing kind of translates over to the Marine Corps. So I'm just going to add to that because the, the Marine Corps in all branches, uh, and we're obviously familiar with the Marine Corps, but, um, 
there's different leaders throughout. You have good leaders, you have bad leaders, and we talk about the mentorship, and you can learn from both. But uh, it, it was a huge foundation in my life as well in having those people who essentially were there when no one else was there. Um, and a little bit of different time. I was in from 93 to 97, so I, and I don't know um, where you, what you had available, but all we had was pen and paper. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't reach out to mom, couldn't reach out to dad or, or my wife at the time. Um, so those people that were around be- ended up becoming family. Um, and it sounds like you had a very similar experience as you were going through them. It hasn't changed is what mm-hmm. I'm getting at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how did you start to take those leadership skills in the Marine Corps? And then did you start to get Marines under you? And then how were you learning to pass that on? So coming back from Afghanistan, so that now we're in... September 2012, came back, I actually turned 21 uh, in, the, well, that October. So we, I went to my first Marine Corps ball as a corporal. And for the same reason, after Afghanistan excelled, became a martial arts instructor. I mean, everything I could possibly do, I took advantage of while overseas. Did some college classes, you know, from a distance. I really just kind of set myself apart. So coming back as an NCO, a uh, non-commissioned officer, Tasha. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Still don't that, know what it means, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, coming back, it, it really, it really kind of just set me up for what the next step was. I knew I wanted to deploy again. I knew I wanted to uh, lead Marines, if you will. But it wasn't until I actually got back from my first tour that I was given a essentially a platoon of Marines. And the the skills that you learn when you think back to that, just from you know, having NCOs over you, Marines over you that were leading you, what was your first experience in leading other Marines? And and just to set it up, I remember mine, I fumbled all over it. There was times where I thought you led all Marines the same, and then you realize, no, they're not all going to respond the same. And there's a learning curve into taking those Marines under you. What was your experience like? I, I definitely agree with that learning curve part. There's definitely a lot of Marines who are completely oblivious. They are basically trained. They got to their MOS school and then they get to you and they're just a young 19 year old. And I'm like, okay, was I like that? Like, was I completely an airhead? Uh, But then seeing my mentors or or experiencing a deployment with them, you, at least what I did, I picked and chose the different leadership traits that I liked. Some guys were more authoritative. Some guys would just straight chew your ass out. Other guys would be more persuasive. And so I kind of picked and chose the leadership traits that they were offering and kind of collectively made my own based off of those pretty much going through and vetting, if you will, like the goods and the bads, because you will have some, excuse my language again, but shitty leaders. Absolutely. And, and not everybody's going to understand this, but you are a hard charger you're picking up corporal quick. You picked up Sergeant in four years, which is not easy to do. Three years, three years. (laughs) Um, uh, That's very unusual. So the focus that you had was different than a lot of the Marines that out there. They were um, not to, you know, just have a broad brush of all of the Marines, but most of them aren't focused on getting to Sergeant in three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just use myself as an example. I was out till three, four in the morning to get back to work at six. And I was, I'm not focused on that career trajectory. Mm-hmm. I was having a good time. Oh, yeah. Uh, Paul, I was just going to say, Paul and Javi were probably out till four. I think there's been some stories. So, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a balance. <laughs> it's a balance. Have a little fun. Do a little I, I will say this. The the relationship with the Marine Corps and having a good time is, is hand in hand. They, they correlate. But I feel like... Whether you're a good leader or not, overall, the mission is the priority. The mission is what you live for in the Marine Corps. So if you can go out to five, six in the morning partying, but at zero seven, you're in formation ready to go, which I've done for four years straight. <laughs> uh, that, that's just it is what it is. You yeah. just get it done. Um, and it's yeah. a lot easier when you're 2021. 20, oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So, <laughs> so leading up to my question there, there's um, there's just so much focus on your career and um, the Marine Corps, and I can hear the passion and the love of what Absolutely. you were doing. Absolutely. Uh, so why'd you get out? What was the, what, Good how question. did, what was that decision mm-hmm. process like? So that's a very loaded question. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some more context. After, after artillery observing, there's a little bit more of career progression involved. So you go on to become what's called a joint fires observer. So now you are 
recognized, if you will, through the DOD to effectively and timely deliver air, air delivered munitions. So now you can talk to pilots. Now you can deliver a bomb from an aircraft or a helicopter or something along those lines. So now that's another notch in my belt, if you will, that I, again, completely was in love with. The, the idea of delivering fires from an aircraft absolutely made me amazing. But as far as me willing to do what was ne- what excuse me, what needed to be done for the next step, if you will. So I excelled again in that program, graduated top of my class, and now I'm a JFO. I'm a joint fires observer. So going into my second deployment as a corporal, now, now I'm a part of a four-man team, a captain, uh, a sergeant, a corporal, and then a junior Marine. And then they're called what's called a FIC, a firepower control team. So it's a JTAC, a joint terminal, ter- uh, joint terminal attack controller, a fires chief, which was me, which was the JFO, a communications chief, which was a senior radar operator, another sergeant, and then a junior radar operator a guy who needs to hold a saw, which was why he was a junior Marine. So this four man team that we did, we were, we were able to go forward and work with all these different special communities. So when I say special, a lot of special forces. So Anglico, their mission is to provide, um, MAGTAF commanders, Marine Air Ground Task Force. That's what MAGTAF stands for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Commanders, the ability to have a, fire control team attached to them and deliver munitions that are organic to the United States. So real quick on that, let's say we're attached to the French Foreign Legion. The French Foreign Legion doesn't have any kind of aircraft, at least close air support aircraft, organic to them. So what the Marine Corps will do, they'll facilitate a four-man team, my four-man team, to provide that capability to them. And so we were attached to all these special, these very special communities. I was able to work with MARSOC Marines, Special Forces, Army Special Forces, some SEALs. Uh, I was able to work with the Air Force, uh, CCTs, which is a combat controller, something like that along the lines. Um, I was able to work with British Special Forces, uh, Australia Special Forces, anybody and everybody who was special or at least held a title was special. I was able to do that in my second deployment for the next nine months. It's pretty incredible for a kid from North Highlands. So yeah, hobby. <laughs> at the time now I'm 21 years old. I actually turned 22 overseas. I was in Iraq at the time and I turned 22, but at this point I'm working with all these special guys that big picture Marine Corps is still there. I'm still being regimented. I still have to follow the orders of the captain. Don't get me wrong. But then we're, we're doing joint team ops. So my captain and the jun- and his sergeant uh, are on a different continent, if you will. They're in the Middle East, and I'm in Africa with my junior Marine, and we're doing a whole different mission. So mm-hmm. we were able to be flexible in that aspect. And what I'm getting at is that I was so heavily involved with the special community, I didn't want to do anything other than that. Yeah. So re- re-upping, or excuse, excuse me, re-enlisting into the Marine Corps That was an uh, an option for me, but I wanted to do it in MARSOC, Marine Special Operations Command. (laughs) So the story story gets good. I can talk about this. Yeah, no, 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 keep going. No, (laughs) I want to. I want to hear. So what what happened? So while I was in Africa, I had some downtime, and then there's this thing what's called the indoc, the indoctrination, if you will. So there, it's a prerequisite essentially to joining, um, you know, some of these elite forces, specifically the MARSOC community. Um, it involved a, an untimed, uh, ruck, which is a weighted hike, if you will, uh, a swim. And then of course, just a, a, a very high PFT, a PFT physical fitness test. It has its own parameters, but essentially you have to be top, uh, PFT, you have to make the, the swim, and then you also have to make the hike. And there's also a little bit of an interview process before you actually go to, uh, what's called selection. So. I was doing the pre-course to the pre-course for selection, if you will. And it, it's, it's actually a big, it's a big event. It happens every three months in the Marine Corps. You know, these recruiters come out from MARSOC and they say, okay, so who wants to join class X at the end of the year? And before you get to that point, you have to make the basic, you have to meet the basic requirements. So going back to the run, I aced the run, no problem. The interview, I had the reputation from having two, uh, or excuse me, being in the middle of a, of a current deployment and then already having a successful deployment. So the interview went fairly easy. 
the runtime went fairly easy again, but it was uh, the hike. The hike, I barely passed it. Um, I did complete it. And I did it twice, um, but it was the swim. And by swim, I mean drown. They drown you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a huge aspect of, you know, they want you to die before you quit, essentially. And so that's why I kind of say drowning. I mean, it's all controlled. There's safety swimmers. There's, you mm-hmm. know, in case you need oxygen, there's oxygen. But essentially, there's a pool and you get to tread water forever. And they don't tell you the time. So it's, it's a very psychological event, if you yeah. will. Oh. And so I got to a point after about an hour, maybe two hours of treading water where it was either I give up or I drown. And for me, it was getting over that obstacle of being able to pass the event by giving everything it takes. So the instructors and the recruiters are looking for someone who is not willing to quit. And unfortunately, I quit. Yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, you explained it incredibly well. It's difficult for people to understand that haven't been in the military or the Marines to understand what, and I didn't go through any of that, but uh, the Marine Corps within itself, like, you just don't quit. Um, there's just those, mm-hmm. and the Marines will push, 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 push to get you to that point. And at the time, you don't know if you're going to die from running 40 miles. or So I, I completely understand. Yeah. And when you talk about it like 15 years you know, later, 10 years later, you know, it was a moment in, in your life. But at the time, I imagine incredibly stressful with all of everything that's going on and the pressure being put on to make that happen. So it, it was definitely uh, discouraging to, to an aspect, you know, hey, I gave it everything I got. But then also I still had coming back to the state side and trying out again. So this now what we're, the time period we're talking about is spring of 2013. I didn't get back until sw- summer of 2013. And so now I had all of summer to train again before the end of my enlistment um, in, no, excuse me, I'm, I'm all wrong. It was the spring of 2014, then the summer of 2014, because my the end of my enlistment was the October of 2014. So I had until October to decide and tell the monitor, hey, this is what I want to do. I can either extend my current enlistment to actually try out and see if I pass or I get completely separated. Now, that was for MARSOC. If I wanted to laterally move to a different MOS, the Marine Corps told me that, like, hey, re-enlist as an 0861 sergeant at this time because I was a sergeant, um, and then they'll give you 42500 bucks. So mm-hmm. I, actually de- I actually denied those orders to try to see if I could pass the indoc. So I took the indoc a second time mm-hmm. in Pendleton and uh, ended up failing the swim part again. Yeah, so it's not necessarily failing. You you just have to get to the point where you pass out. Essentially, yeah. essentially <laughs> pass, exactly. Yeah. Um, so and I wouldn't say you quit or fail. There's just a, a point that some people psychologically that's a hard it, it to was, let that happen. To it your was body. a huge. It was a huge upset for me um, because I got to a point where I could no longer backpedal and say, "Hey, monitor, I actually do want to reenlist for four years in my current MOS because those slots are filled." So the monitor has to meet a quota at, at every end of the. I think they're fiscal year in the Marine Corps ends on October. So it's October to October. And conveniently, my enlistment was at the end of October. So I had a certain amount of time to either tell this man, hey, or excuse me, this Marine, the senior Marine at that, I want to either reenlist or I want to get out. So I ended up taking that route and transitioning out of the Marine Corps. So you hold on for us civilians. Yeah. So, um, and to want it so bad. So you fail it the second time. And so one, that's disappointing in itself. But you wanted, you would have re-enlisted had you, had they chance. So after second time and not passing that test, you would have re-enlisted if you could? I would have, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so with the Marsoc community, you're allowed to be my MOS, but as a support battalion. And for me, that wasn't cool enough. I wanted to be what's called a CSO, <laughs> a Critical Skills Operator. 0372. These guys are top of the line. I got to work and live with them for a month. Like these guys were amazing. All this amazing stuff that I got to do with them was because of those guys. And so I didn't want anything else. My, my mindset was changed at that point. So you thought, oh, civilian life will be cooler. <laughs> I ended up re-enlisting into the reserves. <laughs> yeah, but you really didn't have a choice. You made a choice of I'm mm-hmm. chasing my dream yeah. or, I'm, or I'm ending up in the civilian world. Exactly. Um, which there's a lot to be said for that. Um, there's a lot to be said. What, 22 at this time? I was I was turning 23 that year. So, yes, okay. 22. So let me ask you some questions. And I, 
with all due respect. Sure, of course. Any arrogance involved in making that decision at the time. When you look back now, were you a young 23-year-old that said, I'm a young 23-year-old. I think I can take this on. Like, all Marines are arrogant. There's no doubt about that. But was there a level that you look back and you hmm. I, I agree with all Marines are arrogant part. But I reflect back on my career as a Marine in those four years. Excelling through the schoolhouses, leading Marines, being able to deploy amongst other peers who had the same qualifications as I did, but they I was ultimately chosen over somebody else. So I let my my career reflect that decision based off of the community that, that I was in personally. Not a lot of people can say that they had a similar experience to mine just because of whether it's they didn't have enough heart for it or they joined the re, uh, for all the wrong reasons. Um, I say this with love, Paul, but, you mm-hmm. know, Paul, he joined for reasons that were not similar to my reasons. But also, if you look back, he was eager to get out and I was eager to continue to serve. So mm-hmm. for me, arrogance played a, a part in the aspect of, OK, like, yes, my mentality is a go getter. Like you said, hard charger earlier, of course. Um, but I don't think that affected the decision. No, I love it. It's it's uh, it's a great answer. You have confidence. You earn that confidence. Yeah. Um, you had a career that the people that are listening to this that are military are going to absolutely geek out about it. And Natasha's going to have to go back and listen and decipher half the things <laughs> oh we talked gosh. about today. But. And I'll bring it back. I think <laughs> <laughs> most civilians would. There's a lot in there that just I, I, yeah. again I could talk about this all night. Yeah. No, and I knew you would. That's why I love. It. That's what this is why we get into conversations, ask all these questions, and I do have to go back and reflect. But I think you really hit it, Anthony, to make such a decision for something that you loved, and it was like I'm going for the dream, or I'm going to lose all. Like you literally bet it all from an outside perspective i think absolutely especially when you when you add money involved so marine corps is waving this big check for almost 40 grand i'm like okay it's not about monetary value i'm i'm no. in it for other reasons and so i did make that decision yeah, any regrets no regrets no good. regrets good if i could do it again i would 100%. i love it I love it. I love it. So I think so. We, I think we have to talk about the transition out. We do. So you've okay. made you've made so you made your decision. You didn't pass the test. You decide to leave the Marines. So what was that? And I'm interested mindset wise. Is like you're probably disappointed, right? It's probably a little bit uncomfortable. You're transitioning back to you know civilian life. Did I use that right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, what take us through that transition of going back? What was the plan when you left? So it it definitely resonated with me. There's there's a big little oh a little guilt there. Like okay, well, wasn't good enough, if you will. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the Marine Corps they they harp on like overcoming adversity. So I wasn't going to let this little decision or a failure in my case pro- prohibit me from continuing my success in the Marine Corps. So I actually ended up reenlisting into the reserves out of Concord, California in my same OMOS holding the same billet, but now with a little bit more experience from the active duty side. So I did another four years in the reserves. And what were you doing on the, so the reserves is what it's one weekend a month, two weeks a year. Is it still that? It's still that it's still that, um, you can, you can activate, which means essentially you become active duty orders and that's pertinent to like, let's say if you get deployed, so out of Concord, California is what's called Sixth Anglico. So now it's the sixth company within my community. Now it's the reserve side, though. So they're no longer in Concord. They're up at JBLM uh, in Washington. But um, back in this was 2014. Now I had a month to report back into Concord. So I did that. Now I'm, I'm coming from active duty Anglico and kind of seeing all these peers, all these other sergeants, staff sergeants, captains, everybody who has the reserve side of it. So their entire career was five, six years in the reserves, not deploying and doing exactly what you just mentioned, uh, one week in a month, two weeks out of the summer kind of deal. So now I'm coming in with some real world experience. Some of my peers growing up in active duty were actually the I and I there, which is the uh, essentially the active duty personnel for the reserve side, because there's there's a lot of coordination involved, if you will. So these guys who have similar experiences as me, they see me, they're like, oh, Sergeant Marty's here. Oh, this, they're going to do well. And I and I did just that. I, I prepped these Marines 
uh, with real world experience and, and, and how to talk to pilots, how to coordinate, how to call in effective fires. And I actually got praised by the CEO and a lot of the captains due to are above me by, by, by a lot. Yeah. And they're saying, well, Hey, Sergeant Martinez, he knows what he's talking about. Like he knows how to talk. And so I was able to prep these Marines for the next deployment. And we were actually slotted to go to Syria, uh, in 2018. So, oh, excuse me, 2017. And so we did a workup for about two and a half years. And out of all the sergeants, staff sergeants, gunnery sergeants, captains, everyone pointed to me and said, Hey, Sergeant Martinez has to go. He's the only one with the experience. So what made you, what made you the best? How did you connect with these people that you were training and how did you influence them in a way that was so effective? I'm kind of flattered that you say the best. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of, <laughs> kind of just speaking on my experience. I, by no means that I feel like I was the best, but um, when you have all these different dudes telling you, you are, you kind of believe it at a point. Mm-hmm. Um, by no means was I an overachiever. I kind of was just uh, an effective leader. So I was straight to the point, no sugarcoating anything, kind of the same mentorship principles that I was forged, if you will, and I implemented into the reserves as well. So what was the hardest part of that? What was, was there ever, I mean, you get the people that don't listen, you get the people that don't want it as much as you do. You get the ones that maybe they don't like your style. So what was the hardest part at that time about being a leader? Uh, Breaking uh, the routine, breaking the routine as far as these career reservists are about to go to Syria with zero experience. So breaking the routine, oh, I'm going to come back to my nine to five. Some of these guys mm. were cops. Some of these guys were yeah. everything. But yeah, everything it's you like, can possibly imagine. They come from all around the country, especially the captains, like just breaking that routine and say, well, hey, we're, we're going to do this, but like on a different level. And so um, I hate to sound like very cliche, but just break break the chains, if you will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I want to be sensitive to time because we're, we're about 45 minutes in. Yeah. Um, so can we transition into your civilian? So you go from reserves into civilian. what's what's your job? What What's that like? I remember going through it was difficult for me and I didn't have the story career you did. So mm-hmm. what was that like and what were you doing? So transitioning from active duty to the civilian side, um, I thought it was going to be rainbows and I was going to get it all did. Uh, <laughs> oh, I feel like I've heard that from every single one. Uh, a, f- a federal job ready to go. Everyone's clawing to grab me. It wasn't like that. It was a rude awakening. So yeah. transitioning from the Marine Corps, from that regimented lifestyle, waking up at zero whenever and going until they say go, um, leaving all that behind and kind of just waking up at, at this point, my mom's house because I had nowhere else to go. I'm like, all right, what to do now? I guess I could find a job. Uh, so I tried, I tried school. Um, I was successful in school. Just school for me was not my biggest priority. Then I went to go work for my dad. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, he's been in the construction trade since before I was born. So I kind of found it easy to go work for him. After about a year, though, of doing that, I decided I was like, hey, you know, after all these things that I've done in the Marine Corps, you know, all my success, I, I can lead. Like I could I could run my own company. And so I actually did that. I, I took the leap and, and kind of moved away from in being employed by him to employing myself. And what was your company? What, what were you doing? What kind of construction? So at the time I uh, was in a drywall company. So my dad's been a drywaller for forever. Um, and so I tried that and I started off as a patch guy, if you will. So doing small patches for different companies, real estate companies, um, different contractors, kind of just building clientele, if you will. And then it kind of grew into complete houses and then maybe some apartments and then just securing bigger and bigger contracts. And then I had to hire on more people. So I ended up kind of formalizing it, if you will, and, and applying to the state to get the, the drywall license. So a couple of questions around this. Uh, so your experience in the Marine Corps, how much did that help you as you were starting off on and opening your business? The, the, the experiences, the train, all of it, how, how did it help you? I say it's fundamental. I say it's fundamental just because uh, the Marine Corps harps on, and I, I hate to come back to the Marine Corps every time and time again, but it's, it's honestly true. Uh, proof is in the pudding, if you will. 
they harp on small unit leadership. So you and a couple of guys or even yourself, you're given a task and you have to complete that task for mission success, if you will. Um, so given that, like it kind of just set the foundation for, for what I am today. And then the follow up question to that is, as you're hiring on employees of your own, the leadership, it was a rude awakening for me coming from the Marine Corps into the civilian mm-hmm. world. How did that translate from you for you? Was, was it difficult? Did you have to adjust your style or was your style already OK? Initially, yes. I, w- I want to say like the first year, year and a half. It was rude. It was it was tough. Um, <laughs> after that, though, I kind of became regimented in a way. So employing guys who I knew were going to be beneficial. And if it w- if there wasn't a benefit, then I would replace them or essentially, you know, find a uh, common ground with them and, and mentor them, if you will, into someone I wanted to, to be efficient. And so as you're building out this business, any thoughts of doing anything else? Like I'm going to go put on a suit and tie or I'm going to go sit in a <laughs> cubicle or this was your path. Like you could see it. I've never imagined a job outside of either working with my hands or law enforcement. Um, Again, the Marine Corps has a big, big uh, motivation to that. Uh, I got to see, you know, this is figuratively, figuratively speaking in the trenches, if you will, I could never see myself outside of that working a nine to five at some office company or something like that. I'd, I don't feel like I don't have the etiquette for that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's I hard might. for us <laughs> uh so how long have you been in business now how long have you owned your business um formally about five years now okay informally closer to eight so go back to five or eight do you see this javi today is this the man that you saw and with the business you have was that the vision Or did this happen along the way? Absolutely not. So I feel like progression is huge. Um, You you find some common ground, if you will. Most most of my my work is residential, but I do have commercial um, projects as well. But when you're dealing with clientele and stuff like that, you build a rapport, if you will. So they call me saying, hey, Javi, you're the guy. You come highly recommended. We want to do this kitchen renovation or this bathroom renovation or they want to tear down some walls. So I feel like with that comes progression because I started off as a patch guy. Oh, you you put your fist through the wall. I can patch that. And then it became you know, hey, let's do the whole wall now or let's do the whole house. So over the years, I've definitely seen progression, um, both in my success, in my clientele, working the guys and all that good stuff. So definitely didn't see that hobby five years ago. So who's the hobby you see in 10 years? I'm not still in your question. I'm like, no, I might be ahead. a little bit. Go ahead. Do you see that? Do, they, do you have a vision? Like super successful for where you're at today and it's progression. Is there a vision? I don't want to sound naive, but uh, in 10 years, I want to be retired. I don't I don't want to swing a hammer anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to uh, do the face to faces with customers. I, I want to I want to get to a point where um, I let the capital work itself. So buy my own real estate, remodel my own real estate and sell my own real estate. I'm grateful and thankful for all my success with my clients. But if we if I can mitigate that aspect of it and kind of just let the money revolve itself, I feel like that is where you need to be. So there's a vision. There's a vision. There's absolutely a vision. And um, it's in the starting phases right now. So we're getting there. So taking taking those steps, Javi, every time, I mean, it must be, are you sure about every decision you make or the steps you take or the next, you know, part of your vision? Or are you just kind of learning as you go? What's some of that mindset? Because you keep getting to the next level. And I think some people, that's the question they have is like, how do I get to that that next step? So I, I have a I have two parts to that question. The first part being um, luck. I, I have some indifferences with luck. And again, going back to the Marine Corps, I don't feel like I'm lucky throughout my Marine Corps career, but I feel like I was prepared. And when opportunity meets preparation, I feel like that's luck. And the same is true with the career. So to answer your question, yes, but also I who knows? I mean, no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. 
-hmm. So we, we just don't know. But for me to make those decisions, it's based off of, am I prepared for the next step? And if, if an opportunity presents itself, will I have the means to do so? So there's a risk in everything you do every day. And I feel like in the construction industry, uh, outside of your clientele, let's say the investment part of it, something that I'm kind of dabbling in with right now, you don't know what's going to happen. You mm -hmm. can only just take the leap. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because I was wondering where you were going to go with the luck um, and because it, it just resonates. It is the Marine Corps preparation, um, adapt, overcome, all of those things come into play when uh, people from the outside look. And, and it's not just Marine Corps, but people in general that are successful that have done the preparation and say, oh, they're overnight success or they were lucky. You know, no, 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 there's mm -hmm. nights and there's weekends mm -hmm. and there's all of this preparation mm -hmm. that got into that so-called luck mm -hmm. that we call it. Yeah, so I have, um, you know me, I have a couple questions. So one, and it was actually from our last guest, they wanted to ask the next guest, so I'll ask you, um, what was or was there one decision that was pivotal to the role you have right now? Absolutely. And uh, I feel like that is taking the leap from working for my dad into working for myself. Um, I feel like that was a huge pivotal point for me. Okay. Going into the unknowns, the uncertainties, mm -hmm. a guaranteed paycheck into, hey, I got to go find my own gas money. I got to I got to, you know, find my own clientele. That was that was a huge leap for me. So taking the risk, taking the risk. Yeah. 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 Which is a, a thread throughout your <laughs> life is taking the risk. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Um, so one, one more question kind of about the leadership. So you have the guys that you manage that work for you and then you have the customers and, you know, being the face of that, I know we've talked about it and kind of growing, I guess it'll be a two part. So one growing your business, um, how, how do you, how are you growing your business? So right now I can honestly tell you the majority of my business is word of mouth. A lot of people are satisfied with the product that I gave them and they they recommend me to X person and it just grows from there. So I read somewhere that on average, one person knows about 200 different people. And it's honestly fairly true because for the last eight, nine years, excuse me, well, seven, eight years now that I've been doing this, um, it's all been word of mouth. Now, I do have the license formally online with different agencies like the BBB, um, Angie's List, California State mm -hmm. License Board, of course, and everything is like five star rating or A plus rating. So delivering a product that people like ultimately gives you more. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I'm going to connect some dots with some, uh, one of our other guests, Danny, who owns his own pool company mm -hmm. for I don't know. 30, 40 years. Sorry, Danny, if that's too many, but um, there's an aspect that I can see in your personality is just the likability. And I, I'm going to assume your work is incredible, but you can have incredible work. And if you're not a nice individual, those recommendations don't always come. So I think there's a combination of, of course. And, and that's what Danny had told us. He's never advertised in 30, 40 years. It's word of mouth and his business is Grown. So um, I think it's a thread as we yeah. talk through leadership. Things. And I think that's where I tie. I think being a leadership to your uh, there's one there's managing your guys and then there's also connecting with your customers. And mm -hmm. sometimes people think, oh, well, they don't report. Right. Customers don't report to you, but you're still a leader in the aspect. So do you see similarities to how you treat your people or those that report to you and those that you work for? Yes, absolutely. So. The guys, we, we do initial walkthrough, if you will, with the customer. We do the face-to-face, -face, the coordination, and then I start to tell them what the plan is for, let's say, Monday. Uh, behind the scenes, I'm coordinating with the guys. I show up Monday as well. We talk about it, and we go through a game plan. And so how I get the guys to understand that is to give them a task and then have them report back to me if they don't complete the task or if there was an issue issue with the task. And then that kind of translates over to the customer, allowing them to see, you know, some of those um, uncertainties, if you will, or those unexpected items as well. But uh, there's definitely similarity there. Yeah, I love it. Good. I have, I have a couple of questions. Do you think it's unusual, your, your success and where you're at and the maturity and where you're at within the millennial population? 
No, so I, I feel I feel like what you're trying to, to say is um, for me coming from humble beginnings and, and being a, a an older brother and then of course the Marine Corps and then now a father, business owner, um, I don't allow myself to succumb to, you know, the the idea behind, hey, you're going to be spoon fed everything. No, I don't agree with that. I feel like you have to go out and earn it. Um, maybe it's because of my Marine Corps background. Maybe it's because of the deployments. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a father. Um, but outside of the obvious motivation to be a provider for my family, I feel like uh, you and what you're willing to do kind of sets you apart. So if you want to be a millennial or generation X or Boomer, respectfully, I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. oh, I just, I love you, but, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that you know, whether you want to fall into that demographic or that stereotype, that's solely up to you. Uh, absolutely, I, I don't identify Got as a ya. boomer. Got you. Hey, you're, you're a marine. You can take it. <laughs> I can. Um, He's bright red right now. Uh, <laughs> I am. It's the blood pressure. It's boiling. It's no, the I'm beard. just kidding. Um, so. There's a couple of staple questions that both of us ask. So mm-hmm. um, the question that I want to ask you, the first one is, if you could have a conversation with anybody, living or dead, um, who would it be and why? Oh, gosh, I've been dreading this question. Oh. <laughs> Did you know he asked yes. this? Yes. <laughs> I've been listening. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, I would say uh, General James Mattis. Um, mm. uh, he was... Retired Marine Corps General, former Secretary of Defense, I believe. This guy, just a quick little history buff on him. Um, He went his entire Marine Corps career as an officer and uh, never married, never fathered children. His sole purpose in life was the Marine Corps. And you hear stories, you know, through the grapevine, if you will, like especially on my early enlistment. Um, The things that this guy did were was amazing so i would definitely like to have a beer with him if he drinks i don't know maybe pick, I his, would brain, too. Yeah. pick his brain a little bit about you know some of some of the different experiences that he had uh, even in the marine corps and outside of the marine corps yeah he was an incredible marine and uh, i believe he got into politics following the marine corps a little bit of that um it, it was even before the marine corps he was a part of uh different communities um uh, committees excuse me and then eventually was nominated from uh President Trump to become Secretary of Defense, yeah. and uh, it, it goes to show that his passion for the Marine Corps and, of course, the United States and in, in his political career, he didn't allow himself to be bullied even by the president. He yeah. actually re- resigned um, from being a part of the Trump administrative uh, administration. Uh, because they didn't align uh, with what he was trying to effectively do as the Secretary of Defense, so um, th- that that shows true merit if, and a true gentleman. Absolutely, uh, and he has some one-liners that I absolutely love. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, not not good for this show, but <laughs> maybe after. I'll yeah. look him up after. You'll have to spell his name for me. Uh, and so the 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 last question that I have is for our next guest: What oh, question? Okay. Do you want do you want us to ask them? Um what what's what for you defines success? Oh, I love that one. And we've had that um and we've had that conversation with with some of our previous guests. Do you want to answer it for you? Yes. How do you define it? For me, I, we've actually talked about this, Tasha. Um yeah. how I define success is being significant for people, um, whether it's for my family, for my significant other, my parents, family, friends, kiddos, just being significant. Um, there's no really, there's no real true value, uh, in my opinion, if you, you correlated your success with you know, like a monetary value. For me, it's, it's more simple. It's just being, being significant. Love it. I love it. So I'll ask my one staple question and then I think we'll do the inspire. So my staple question is always, well, has been essentially for older people, what they would tell their 30 year old self. So the boomers. Are, <laughs> <laughs> uh, salty about that one. Um, so um, I'll change it a little bit. So what would you looking back young Javi, 20 year old Marine, what would you knowing what you know now, who you are now, what would you tell your 20 year old self? Do more. Oh, good Do one. Do more. 
Oh, I like it. Do more of what? Everything. 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 If you're in the Marine Corps, if you're in the construction industry, if you are in your industry, just do more. And do you apply that today? Absolutely. I live by that. I have a, I have a thing with, uh, with my wife. It's like, oh, you know, you're always tired and why do you can continue to do this for, you know, like, why do you continue to, to not sleep, if you will? And it's not so much not sleeping. It's just uh, living a life where I'm trying to squeeze, if you will, the most out of it. And if it means giving up a couple hours of sleep, I'll do that. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and uh, it's incredible for your age, just, you know, as you get, I'm, I'm not quite a boomer. I know it's funny, but um, <laughs> so, respectfully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The older you get the, and the more people you see, you know, you lose life, the more it just becomes very, very precious. Yeah, so to absolutely. have that so young, um, it's, a, it's a great, great advice. Yeah, really, really good advice. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here with an inspiration. We asked all of our guests, as you know, who or what inspires them. So if you will, um, will you share who or what inspires you? Um, at this point in my life, as, as a young father, I would say my parents, um, all parents at that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of growing up and, and knowing some of the different obstacles and, and, you know, some of the different hardships of, of early on stuff that you have no idea that actually is happening. Um, but parents, you know, kind of sacrifice the most and I feel like that's huge. So my inspiration would definitely be my parents and, and all parents out there. Hmm, I love that. I do too. I love it. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think I have to get sappy and say my thank you. Javi, you know that I love you so much. You're one of our very best friends. I have literally watched this journey and your progression, and I'm um, always rooting for you. Super proud of you. We don't tell our friends how proud we are of them, so super proud of what you're doing. I've watched you, you know, make time for all the success and the work and I know you work seven days a week and you still make it to hang out with us, right? To the barbecues, to um, just the events. And so you are great dad, family man, best friend, like Marine worker, all of the above. So um, just love you so much. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I loved, I even got some details today that I might have to go back and look up, but um, just really, really appreciate you. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, love you too. Being here. Yeah. And I'll just say thank you as well. So, uh, I really appreciate you on your telling the story, the Marine Corps story. I, I know I'm going to assume that most of your friends don't know how much of a badass you are. Um, <laughs> except for Paul, um, Paul, I mean, Paul knows, uh, other <laughs> Marines, but, um, incredibly storied career. Um, uh, I'm going to spend more time. I look forward to talking to you more and getting more, a little bit more detail because, um, it's incredibly impressive. Um, so thank you for being here and what you're doing and, um, your time in the Marine Corps. Congratulations, you're you're killing it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. it. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll close this out. Gramps, millennial, and hobby out. Mm -hmm.